चार पांच It's supposed to be on, and I love this shit. You know I love this. So where are we? So we're good to go here. We're good to go there. Oh, there we go. So let's so try. Maybe one of these people gets. I don't know. There it goes again. So do we have good connections? Solid Let me. Connections? Let's try back there to those two. It's a Wednesday afternoon, and the only thing you want to do is. <laughs> it's four o'clock on Wednesday afternoon in a cybersecurity seminar. The only thing you want to do is. Technology, cybersecurity, and policy. Technology, cybersecurity, and policy. Okay, so today we're going to have a presentation on blockchain. Now, blockchain came out of nowhere, apparently, and blockchain is all the rage. If you want to work for Walmart and you want to worry about food, guess what? You may have to worry about blockchain. So today we have Dr. Hunter Albright. He works both with Technology Cybersecurity Program and the Business School, and he's going to tell us about Technology. He's going to tell us about blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you all for coming, and it's my pleasure, Dr. Hunter Albright. Very good, Please. thank you. So super excited to be here uh, and share with you a little bit of what we're doing and thinking about relating to blockchain. So who is here to learn how to get filthy rich off of cryptocurrencies? Oh, well, <laughs> well we're not, I'm not talking about that today, but I am going to sort of talk about blockchain and what we're doing uh, at the university and around it. So uh, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I'll share these slides. These are uh, sort of my, my information. I sort of have a dual role. I'm CEO of a company called Curve10 where we do software innovation work really from a data-driven software perspective. Uh, my background is I have a PhD in <coughs> systems engineering. Uh, I did sort of artificial intelligence and optimization uh, work for my research specifically around genetic algorithms back before AI was really cool, I think. Uh, and, but I ended up spending my career in financial services. So I spent sort of 20 years in retail banking, running credit card portfolios, running, lo running loan portfolios. Uh, half in the U.S. and half in Europe, and so have always been really interested in sort of helping people think about technology from the, you know, solving really cool problems, but also from the applied side. And also I'm a big proponent of, from a career perspective, I think you guys, everybody in here engineering, I think? So, I mean, you will have lots of options in terms of career. You don't have to do tech all the time. There's a huge need for people that know the tech, but then can explain how it can be applied uh, from a business perspective. And so we'll touch on that a little bit as we go through the day. So I'm gonna talk about blockchain. Uh, and we'll go through, this is really sort of a primer. We'll cover some of the key challenges, some of the things that I think are really revolutionary in the technology and why, and then the applications that are associated with it. Uh, the first thing I wanted to cover and encourage everybody, if, you, if this ends up being of interest, would love to hear from you and get you involved. We launched the University of Colorado Blockchain Alliance over the summer. This is going to be an interdisciplinary effort across the university to involve the business school, the law school, uh, economics department, uh, sort of f philosophy, uh, as well as engineering. I mean, for me, I, one of the reasons I love blockchain is you get to talk about all these different elements in one conversation, whether it's uh, crypto economics, game theory, cryptography, uh, distributed networks, uh, cybersecurity, and we'll touch on it. The policy opportunities are huge in blockchain. We really don't have any idea to how to do this properly at scale. Uh, Bitcoin has been a great experiment, uh, and I think it has phenomenal potential to be a real currency for a, for a long time, uh, but we're learning as we're doing it. We're sort of making it up as we go. Uh, our vision for the Blockchain Alliance is really to integrate leaders across national labs, academia, 
uh, and corporations. And so we're going to be actively recruiting members from all these different groups. We've got the NSA. We've got NRAIL. I was just at an event for Denver Startup Week where I was on a panel with a researcher from NWEL. There's some really interesting work going on on blockchain uh, about how we secure our uh, energy grid. Uh, it is the, one of the things the energy grid is most concerned about is resiliency and public safety. It is a critical piece of infrastructure in the United States. Uh, if we lose power for more than a couple days, it impacts the Department of Defense. It generally would cause riots and panic within the population. And so securing the power grid uh, is, a, is a really high importance for the government and for different states states and locales and so really some interesting applications there so we'll look to do projects uh, both with the agencies as well as companies and really looking for students and looking to create looking for students to get involved and create opportunities for you to work on projects that might be of interest our focus is in three things one is community engagement so we're going to do work to help advise companies help talk to groups about help really helping the general public understand more about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, what the technology is, why it's exciting, where it could be applied. We're going to do collaborative research across the university with other uh, universities uh, as well as with industry. And then the last one is education. Uh, there is a huge demand for resources in this space. People come out knowing how to program in blockchain and there are examples where they'll make a half million dollars a year, sort of one or two years out of uh, undergrad. If you learn how to do it, it is a huge area. Um, we can get you in contact with companies. I would keep on your radar the um, F Denver, which is one of the two largest, is the second largest Ethereum conference, which is held in Denver in February. We will be doing a series of seminars in conjunction with F Denver to prep people for the hackathon, but it's a great way to get involved in the community. Uh, and I'll also mention it later, but we will have, IBM is coming a week on sep Monday, September 30th. They're gonna, we're gonna do a workshop. Uh, they're gonna teach about sort of their blockchain technologies, and then there's some opportunities with the Global Blockchain Summit, which is being hosted in Golden, uh, October 2nd and 3rd. So I'll share more information, but there's a lot of opportunities across the board. So if you send me those dates, I'll propagate them. To okay, the that would be great. All right, so let's jump into overview. So how many, how many people are, I would say, familiar, <coughs> would you say familiar with blockchain, right? How many people have gone a little bit down the rabbit hole? And who's, how many people are completely down the rabbit hole, right? All right, we got, so I have been completely consumed by this sort of technology, both from just the tech perspective, because I can sort of geek out about it, and it's super interesting to sort of think about all these different things and how they come together, because all of the technologies previously existed. There's nothing new in, block, in Bitcoin, which blockchain is sort of the backbone of, other than it was how everything got brought together, which is you know, fascinating, and I think there's lots of potential for the applications going forward. So most of us and most people know about blockchain because of Bitcoin, right? It is sort of the backbone of what has sustained Bitcoin. And the interesting thing here from a cybersecurity perspective is the Bitcoin blockchain has not, has not been compromised. In the 10 years that it's been running, uh, it has not been compromised. What has been compromised are all the things around the edges, all the things that we know are already cybersecurity risks in terms of key management, in terms of centralized computers that where it might be sort of consolidating data and acting as a honeypot for somebody. So it's really interesting in terms of that the core technology has up, been upheld. But how we think about the governance, the policies, the key management, the development of applications to help people use it and become more knowledgeable, we still have a long way to go. But it's a really great proof point that it has withstood all of the attacks that it is sort of been undergoing over sort of the last 10 years. So, but the big secret is, right, it's just a database. Uh, and blockchain is, not only is it just a database, 
it's just a database that is replicating a ledger that has been a tool that we have used for centuries. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting, when they trace back the history of money, we don't know when money started because the first evidence of writing we have is a ledger. So, you know, it is a really interesting thing that we're getting so excited about something that is, one, just a database, and it's, it's implementing something digitally uh, that we've had around forever. Um, but it is really capable of so much more in terms of the applications, and sort of we'll walk our way through that. Some of the things that people are starting to think about from an application perspective, financial transactions, uh, which those are all the cryptocurrencies and the tokens and things of that nature. Super important because the, the systems and the ecosystems and sort of the economies that are being created because of blockchain can't exist without a cryptocurrency. So blockchain is this technology can be applied a lot of ways, but you have to have a cryptocurrency that really facilitates the commerce as we go through, and we'll talk a little bit more of it, but it's important to sort of, you really can't have blockchain on loan, you have to have some way of economically incentivizing to play the different roles that you need within the overall ecosystem. Uh, supply chain records is a big area. Um, as James mentioned, Walmart and others, medical, uh, there's a lot of counterfeit. Uh, worked with a company locally that is putting little nano chips on diamonds uh, so that people can, one, register the diamonds and then be able to check and make sure they're counterfeit, see if they're on the blockchain to ensure that they're not counterfeit or fake, because uh, it happens quite a bit. Uh, there's, a, I think, the general rule of thumb about either one or two out of every five luxury end items are counterfeit. Uh, it, is a, it is a pervasive problem in that industry that they're trying to figure out how to solve, and they believe a combination of nanotechnology and blockchain uh, will be a way to really sort of dampen down and stem sort of counterfeit items. Uh, medical records are super interesting uh, in terms of being able to, one, make data available to uh, researchers without disclosing our private information, but also then potentially for us to monetize our private information should we want to share it. Uh, so there's, you know, some really interesting elements there. Uh, had a really interesting meeting uh, with uh, the Department of Education and the Colorado State or Colorado State Department of Higher Education earlier this week around academic transcripts and certificates. Uh, they're very interested in terms of thinking about how blockchain technology could help make that process easier for you once you graduate, both to authenticate that you got the degree you're claiming you've gotten, but also if you need your transcripts rather than having to you know, send in $35 and wait a couple weeks and get a digital copy, you, know, you can pull it off the blockchain, so to speak. Uh, and so there's a lot of efficiencies of scale. There's a lot of benefits from long-term record keeping uh, that are quite attractive. Uh, and we do have anybody, anybody in um, Alan Paradise's uh, senior capstone class here? OK. So we do have a student team that's going to help us set the groundwork on developing uh, certificates, uh, issuing certificates on the blockchain and developing the interfaces to allow employers and other people then to confirm it. And that's super exciting because we've got interest uh, multiple departments at CU, um, but then the state uh, expressed interest on Monday uh, of doing that as sort of helping do that as a pilot uh, more, more sort of globally across the state. Uh, and then the last one, is energy transactions. It's, uh, and I'll go through a little bit of example here, but the ability for renewable energy and to do uh, energy transactions at the edge of the grid uh, largely probably will be powered by blockchain so that we understand who paid for what. We have this sort of immutable history of all of the transactions and a way to pay for it uh, very seamlessly regardless of the amount of time or the amount of money. So one of the things that I do want to highlight for context, so I like to sort of talk about this, is we are early in the journey. So none of you are old enough to remember AOL, and so, but we are, we are about like 1994 in terms of the internet time frame, right? So there is so much more ahead of us, and if we think about 
sort of in the 60s, this was all about really getting computing power on a desktop so that we could run code and we could just do a lot more computations and solve more challenging problems. The next step was really to do the networking. Uh, we, in the 80s, I think we could argue that the bigger, the, the, an equivalent breakthrough to potentially blockchain was TCP, TCP IP in terms of the protocol of allowing us not to have borders with our communications and being able to send emails everywhere and anywhere and for them not to be censored or stopped because no one could tell which packet was which. And so the, where we are now um, sort of with blockchain is where we were sort of in the early 90s when that potential, the internet, was starting to take hold and we had this ability to publish everything and, and really take advantage of communicating without boundaries. But at that time, people were getting paid a million dollars to develop an HTML page. People didn't know what good applications were, what bad applications were, and that's really where we are. We are trying to experiment as much as we can uh, to figure out how we manage blockchain, how we build good applications, and how we manage the what I would refer to as the unintended consequences. I think blockchain has a lot of socioeconomic impacts that we really don't know, and I'll talk a little bit about, but I mean, we're moving into a model where we're looking at distributed applications. I teach venture planning over in the business school, right? We have been teaching people for hundreds of years that the best business you could have is a monopoly. And now we're completely turning that on its head and saying, you want a distributed business and you're gonna get just a little bit of all the code that you write or how you contribute. And, and we don't know how to think about distributed businesses yet. Uh, it is really interesting uh, about how we think about that shift and I'll sort of touch on that a little bit more. But it's a big, it's a big difference. We're really thinking about creating value from a centralized perspective to moving it to be distributed. And we're going to have to change our governances. We're going to have to change our policies. We're going to have to change our behaviors to think about how we deal with that. Feel free to chime in with any questions as I go. We can sort of make this as interactive as you guys want. OK, so let me talk about my emancipated solar panel. So, and you could think about this example with almost any IoT device uh, as we sort of think about it. So let's say I bought a solar panel and I put it in a field. Uh, so a solar panel like this is probably sort of two and a half megawatts, so it produces a lot of power, probably more power than sort of the average home would have. And so I'm like, you know, I travel a lot. I don't want to have to worry about maintaining it. And actually, so I can install some software so the solar panel will alert a technician when it needs to be maintained. All right, so then that's cool, it's all running. Um, technician comes out and fixes it. And then Excel finally gets in gear and, and, and provides an opportunity for to have a smart contract so that I can sell my power back to the grid. Um, and maybe I have a battery on the side and I can have a smart contract that allows my neighbor to plug in their Tesla and they can charge up their car and we can sort of pay each other. So, you know, all of that is doable today, and, and then I die, right? And I don't, have, I don't have any relatives, and the interesting thing is nothing stops this, right? There is nothing in that scenario that would stop this system from continuing to operate. Uh, the, it has access to essentially a digital wallet. It knows how to exchange money with Excel in terms of the power that's being sold. It knows how to request maintenance. And so all of a sudden we're in a situation where because of blockchain and because of the, the smart contracts, that whether it's a solar panel, whether it's an autonomous vehicle, uh, whether it really ends up being a wide range of devices that exist on the internet, they could run completely autonomously um, without real governance, without sort of oversight, without any intervention. And so this is one of the applications that people are getting really excited about, about how you could set up these, essentially a business out of a solar panel and have it run on its own. 
There are some fantastic examples of uh, artists. Uh, Bjork is one of them out of Iceland, where they are putting individual songs into a smart contract on a blockchain, embedding all of the um, price structures and rights to, to licensing rights to those songs. And so you go exchange and agree on the smart contract, and that song becomes a business in and of itself. Uh, and it makes money, it deposits it into a digital wallet, and again, there's nothing stopping it from continuing to be acting as a commercial entity, if you will, uh, on an ongoing basis. So this whole element of these machine-to-machine -machine transactions in terms of being able to uh, authenticate with each other, trust each other, and then make a transaction is really what's at the core of the cryptocurrency and sort of the blockchain revolution. Okay, so let's talk about some of the fundamental sort of what I view as revolutionary elements within the space. So we talked a little bit about blockchain is, is nothing more than a database. So why are people excited about it? I think there's sort of five key elements that make it interesting and exciting and has this potential to really disrupt. So the first one is really how it tracks and stores information. Uh, and fundamentally, it's this infrastructure that <clears throat> enables us to do a lot more. I think if, as with most stuff in either the algorithm work that you're doing or exposed to, or even just in sort of the coding, right, sort of the greatest power typically becomes, comes from the smallest and most simple loops or series of steps that you can repeat over and over. And so if, you know, a blockchain is basically a series of blocks uh, typically called block height or chain length. Uh, people use different terms. Uh, but all the data gets put into these blocks. And essentially, they get linked. Uh, and one of the key elements about the blockchain is nothing ever gets deleted. Uh, it's one of the things from a behavioral perspective. As a culture, we're going to have to figure out how to navigate because we're used to having an undo button. You don't really have an undo button here. What you do is you add another block. So. Um, if I sort of gave sent Garrett ten dollars or you know a bitcoin by accident, the only way I have to get that back is actually for him to send it back to me, and that that transaction would go into a new block, uh, you know. And so that is a re that's a real sort of difference in terms of how we interact with organizations and people. We have today we have sort of the intermediary which gives us a little bit of risk mitigation, gives us a little bit of comfort in terms of if something goes wrong. Uh, we have to find ways of building that in in an appropriate way in this technology. For the, the purists in terms of where we all manage our own um, private and public keys, which give us access to this, you know, is a pretty scary world for a lot of people. Um, so there is a lot of sort of application development to figure out how we bridge, uh, bridge those gaps. So, but the fundamental structure is that the data are stored in blocks and then it ends up being sort of linked, hence the chain. So we get sort of blockchain out of that database, that simple database architecture. However, there's a couple twists that then make it more exciting. So the first one is the use of cryptography. Uh, and so at the, at the uh, you, has everybody taken those, so SHA-256, right? So that's the main hashing algorithm that's being used. And what ends up happening is all the data that is in a given block gets hashed. And that becomes what is typically referred to as the fingerprint of the block. And then that fingerprint gets put in the header of this block. And then this block gets hashed. And that, that um, hash gets put into the header of the next block and so on. So what ends up happening if, if a bit gets changed down here, the only way that, you know, and then somebody goes to validate this, the only way for you to get away with sort of, you know, your sort of, you know, devious plan is to figure out how to then reproduce the hashes on all the other blocks, right? To sort of catch up and do that within a time frame be so before somebody can validate. So that's the first twist is really just allowing that crypto cryptography to link everything and, and you'll hear people use the term immutable and that's what they're starting to refer to is that because of 
the linking of the blocks using cryptography, changing the data becomes almost impossible. Now, it becomes even harder because of the second twist. Blockchain has been designed to be distributed. And so now, if we take those blocks and we put it on n number of nodes on a peer-to-peer -peer network, now, not only do I have to race up the chain to change all of the hashes in this one chain, I have to do it on, on sort of, it's called um, n minus x nodes, right? So that because of the consensus algorithm, I don't necessarily have to do it on all of them, but I have to do it on a majority of them. And so that is the security protection of the blockchain. It's the combination of the cryptography that links the individual blocks and then the distribution of the copies of the chain uh, that is across a wider network. Uh, and that's, that's why people are so excited about it in terms of it becomes super hard then to get in and change any of the data that exists on a previous chain. So are there 100 million of these things floating around the world? Or I mean, the size and scope sounds like computationally complex, but are there five blockchains? Or it, it, blockchains? It depends. It depends on the network. So I think on the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin blockchain, there's I think there's roughly 200,000 nodes uh, in that ballpark, and that's going to be the largest one because the economics, the incentives of running the nodes are much greater. Um, but you know, on private ones, it could be small, and this is the big debate, and I'll touch on this a little bit later. Is there? people get sort of philosophical and they go into camps around public and private blockchains. And so public blockchains is this concept where any one of us could run a node, any one of us could add data, any one of us could look anything up. And uh, if you go to any of sort of the blockchain sort of websites that allow you to see the chain, it's really pretty cool in terms of being able to see transactions go in, blocks get added. Uh, and that is going to be a phenomenal piece of technology um, because I think you know we've got about six and a half billion people globally that are unbanked, going back to sort of the banking area, right? Those are about two billion that don't have banking accounts at all, two and a half billion, and about four billion that have really limited bank accounts. Yep. So a lot of the people that don't have bank accounts though don't have access to electricity. They're living on two dollars a day. They're so how are they supposed to access this incredibly expensive to run network? <laughs> so it is expensive to run, but not for the end user. So okay. uh, the, the best example is a, there's a company called M-Pesa, which is a financial service company that allows peer-to-peer -peer payments um, through SMS. Uh, and they have been hugely successful in helping revolutionize financial payments and lending within Africa for micropayments. And you just have to have a text-based sort of Nokia phone, is the Nokia sort of 1000 series is the world's most heavily produced. And you can just send all of the uh, cryptocurrency uh, exchanges can be done in the text message. In fact, there's uh, uh, Andreas Antipanopoulos, uh, who is really well known in the industry, has done an exercise where he showed how you could send cryptocurrency through emojis. Uh, and basically, he, what he did is he texted an account on a bulletin board. He had a program set up to read messages from that account and then translate it onto, uh, submit it onto the blockchain. And basically, what he was showing was that you know, one of the powers of this is it really is censorship resistant. There was no way anybody would know that would be a payment. Um, and if you set it up to go to a certain book on Amazon as a comment under a certain username, you know, nobody would be able to tell. Um, so that's where the open platforms become really interesting and people are super excited about helping people do it. Um, people have shown that you can use shortwave radio to send a transaction and then it gets picked up by one of the nodes. So there's a lot of different ways where it would, re if you really were chat wanted to sort of get a transaction across, you could. Um, the hard thing right now is, is teaching people how to do that. Uh, and it is, it is the user interfaces, it's the applications to teach people how to use public and private keys uh, you know, to sort of get into the technology and, and, and how to manage that. 
So the, the storage of the data is really key and really creates a great foundation into protection. Now, the interesting about, thing that that does is it creates trust. Right? We have all sorts of relationships with people um, through the use of an intermediary, right? Credit cards and our debit cards are a great example. We put our money into a bank. Our money doesn't go anywhere. They're using digital ledgers in terms of what we might spend on a Visa card, how it gets reconciled, what we've paid into the banks to sort of reconcile it. I mean, that's, that's sort of digital money, uh, but it's not our money, right? Our money is sitting somewhere and we're just sort of trading it off of the ledger. Uh, but everybody is sort of comfortable with that. Uh, and, but the bank acts as this layer of trust between us and the merchants. Um, what this technology now does is not only does it allow any one of us to trust each other, whether we're in the same room and I'm showing you a $20 bill, or you're on the other side of the world uh, and I'm sending you an equivalent amount of Bitcoin. That gets authenticated and executed the same way we would, we would do uh, if we were ha I was handing you a $20 bill. Uh, and the key problem that had to be solved in the Bitcoin example is what gets termed sort of unsp or a double spend, right? So that because on the internet today, everything is essentially a digital copy. So if you have a song and you go to share it, if you have sort of a file and you go to share it, you're sharing copies of it. And that obviously doesn't work in terms of money. It'd be great to have lots of copies of, you have your own printing press and it really doesn't do much for the holding up the value of the currency at that point. And so the double spend problem is all of these individual transactions and on the Bitcoin network, they get referred to as unspent transactions. Uh, and so everything is like a, a $20 bill. It's unspent, it's sitting out there. And then when you go to spend it, it goes into a transaction. That's the input. And then you have outputs to who you're sending it to. And then you send yourself back the change. Um, so if I spend $15, I'd send myself back $5 minus the fees that I use to pay for the transaction. Um, and then that, that $5 or $4.95 becomes an unspent transaction that I can use down the road. And so it is, it is the money always, the interesting thing about Bitcoin, and you can sort of wind people up about it, is first of all, Bitcoin is really poor branding, right? So uh, for cryptocurrency, there's nothing even close to being physical. Uh, and a lot of people say, why did they ever choose Bit? Because it's like the smallest unit. It's really geeky in terms of sort of how it gets referred to, um, but it is what it is. So, it, you know, the transactions always live on the blockchain, right? They, you know, if I send you money, even though we use that terminology, I'm not doing anything other than basically transferring my ownership of that unspent transaction to you um, through sort of a public and private key signatures uh, as we sort of hand that off. And that's what happened. All the money is always staying in those blocks along the chain. But the combination of the technology creates the trust. And really what then starts to create the trust is the combination of not only the blockchain, but the cryptography in terms of how we sign everything and we hash it and we embed it in the next block. You've got proof of work. Um, so proof of work is the effort that is expended to validate a block and solve the cryptographic puzzle that is part of the process. So when the, when the network was designed, uh, there is, there's, a, there's a series of a, it's sort of a hash that has, it gets set with how many zeros have to be at the beginning of it. And that, the number of zeros in the beginning basically determines the difficulty of finding the right number, which is referred to as a nonce, that goes into your hash to then create it. And so the interesting thing about the Bitcoin network is it gets optimized to have that search, that random search, take on average 10 minutes. And so sometimes it might take two and sometimes it might take 30. They look at doing it on average. And the reason they do that is they're allowing for the increase in computational power, um, whether it be chipsets or memory, uh, to speed that process and allow them to, memorize, uh, to fix it. So 
Uh, but proof of work then causes everybody to have some expenditure, some investment uh, to sort of be running this race to try to, to solve the block. And from a sort of game theory perspective, that helps govern the whole system because you're not going to do that work and that spend real money if you don't have a realistic opportunity of getting a reward. And if you were to be a bad actor in that scenario, um, the way the network protects it is you get paid in Bitcoin. And so if you were doing things to damage the network, well, then you're actually reducing the value of the thing you're getting paid in. And so there's some really interesting dynamics just in terms of how all those elements are being set up. It is a area of a lot of debate in terms of is it the right thing to, for us to be doing that? With 200,000 nodes, we're spending a tremendous amount of energy because all 200,000 nodes do the, the math problem. Only one of them is the winner every time. And so that's a lot of energy to protect the network. Um, but there are other things like proof of stake um, and um, uh, that are being developed to sort of try to be an alternative. Yeah. Uh, that's mining, right? That's the mining part of it, yeah. Okay. Now, the other element that really then helps this is the fact that the mining is exponentially harder than the validation, right? This is going back to that previous slide when we looked at if you needed to try to change sort of a, uh, a block and you were trying to sort of be a bad actor, the amount of work that you have to go through is exponentially more difficult than somebody that just wants to go validate whether a given block is good or whether the chain is good. And so that puts the power um, in everybody that wants to validate. And so the more good actors we have, just trying to validate, which is super quick, uh, you know, the, what we have shown is that that is a high level of security for maintaining a given blockchain. Uh, the other elements are consensus protocols, and that really reflects how we vote. I mean, everything within sort of a blockchain ecosystem is done for the most part on majority rule. So you have, as long as you have 51% of the nodes saying that this is a valid block or this is the longest chain, then it gets added. And so there's, again, the interesting area of research is looking at different consensus sort of protocols and when they should be used and why they should be used to help maintain the security and the quality of a blockchain. Um, the distributed networks really on the back of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sort of um, networks really is a core thing, right? The just spreading everything out increases the level of complexity um, and also allows for us to take down boundaries in terms of who we're able to sort of do commerce with uh, and interact with. And then the last one is the economics. So I think the crypto economics, the game theory that's related in here in terms of the incentives for being a good actor and a bad actor uh, are really interesting in terms of how they get set and how they should evolve over time. There's a lot that we don't know, uh, you know through that process. Uh, the third, third key thing is the removal of intermediaries. And so if you think about this one on the left being sort of a bank, we all go into a bank, it then gets paid out to a merchant, right? Our ability now to completely eliminate that intermediary and do transactions uh, with you know, directly with the party that we want to sort of transact with, irrespective of geography, irrespective of, of time, right? The, the Bitcoin network is up 24 seven, you know, all the time. It doesn't close down. It doesn't matter about time zones. You know, this is a really sort of empowering element that is really taking advantage of all the work that's been done in networking technology and networking optimization. Uh, so I think that's super cool and really changes how we think about, you know, global commerce um, because it really now does provide us the opportunity to connect everybody with different elements. And also not only to buy things, but to be workers in terms of how we think about getting paid. If you're on doing something on Fiverr, one of the best ways to uh, start to earn, you know, get Bitcoin is to do work for Bitcoin, you know. You can put up and you can request to be paid in Bitcoin on Fiverr on a lot of different sites. And you can do small things and people will just, they'll agree to pay you. And it's, 
It's a really interesting exercise in terms of just starting to interact in that co economy, which is sort of outside sort of all the fiat currency uh, and all the main elements. And, and that's sort of going to just continue to grow. Um, the next one is machine to machine transactions. I think as I sort of touched on, this is a really key one around how this will change, what this will enable us to do, and how we'll layer this in with a lot of the other elements that we're doing. Uh, and then the last one is fractional payments. Uh, super interesting here, right? We've never had the ability to pay, have the opportunity to divide a currency to the granularity that we can with the cryptocurrency. So a Satoshi is a 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. And uh, so, you know, that allows us to think about how we pay for things in milliseconds. What about if you only paid for your insurance every time you drive your car? Right down, down to the half second. You know, that's a completely different way of thinking about how you do things. It's one of the things that's really interesting in sort of the energy management and the power grid of how we think about, you know, what gets used or if we thought about how we paid for broadband or any of the things that go down to microseconds. Um, you know, all of that now can be accounted for uh, with the cryptocurrencies. Um, so, so all of that is true. Um, however, there is not just one blockchain. Um, so there's multiple chains in any one of these categories because it's just an implementation. Uh, public blockchain is what we talked about. Private blockchains is really closed to a group of authorized users and, and they control it, right? The critics of this would say, well, that's no better than having a centralized <coughs> database or a centralized company, so why do it? Uh, there are some potential reasons to do it, especially to take out costs in the larger companies, but it doesn't necessarily adhere to some of the philosophical points of view that uh, communities out there have and are sort of trying to drive for more change. Um, but I will say that private blockchains are helping move the needle forward from the technology, and I think they will help push forward a wider adoption understanding. So Libra is a great example. So Facebook's blockchain that they've implemented, right? US was not worried about regulation until Libra. And all of a sudden they're doing a ton of stuff now on the back of it. So whether you like it, whether you like Facebook or not, whether you like private blockchains or not, it is gonna force the discussion around regulation and it's gonna force the discussion around policy and it will probably punch a hole in terms of, there's a, there's a, um, a, a model uh, written by George Gilder, uh, yeah, I think George Gilder, Crossing the Chasm. It's about sort of the technology going from early adopters more to the, the mass market. And so there's always been this chasm in terms of people get attracted because they like the tech, they like to be first, but then really getting to use cases and the wider adop adoption has always been hard. Things like Libra, we believe, will help cross that chasm. It will get it exposed to more people, it will get the lingo more exposed. So it would be something to sort of pay attention to and watch um, what Facebook does with it. There's a lot of people that are interested in riding that wave a little bit, um, but they're also going to get lots of criticism, one, because they're Facebook, and two, because people are sort of anti uh, the, the private blockchain. And then the hybrid blockchain is a really interesting space. So the medical record example or um, land ownership might be an example where you might be able to see whether somebody has bought or sold a piece of property, might be able to see the size of it, might be able to see the price it sold for, but not know who the person is. Um, or you might be able to share your medical records for research, but not necessarily share it, uh, the rest of the details, except with your doctor, so that it's really seamless for you to go from doctor to doctor. And then the other application on the hybrid blockchains is then our ability to sell our data back to people um, and monetize that with uh, sort of micropayments, right? We pay for everything we use today, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you're using, WhatsApp, right? We're paying for that by basically giving away our rights to our data. So the question is, there's some really interesting um, browsers now that are putting, stopping that and that you know, encouraging people to pay or setting up an infrastructure uh, where people would pay to put ads in front of you um, to have access to the data, your browsing history and things of that nature. So people are starting to experiment uh, more with that going forward. Uh, and so it's, it's really the combination of all the, these five things that I think really starts to make uh, the space 
have the potential uh, you know, that everybody's so excited about. A um, couple last things in terms of shifts. So I touched on, it, we're really turning the world on its head from sort of an, how we think about applications, going from, hey, a monopoly is great, to what does a decentralized application and ecosystem look like, and how do we interact in it. Um, so that's the key shift one, and we don't know how to do it. We really don't um, know how to compromise or sort of uh, compensate uh, and interact. It's, you know, one of the things that's fascinating, I find fascinating out of this space is we're really standing on the shoulders of open source development. And so there's a lot of interesting things about, hey, if you write code and it gets embedded in, how do you get compensated for it? And you're actually then encouraged to maintain it and create the next version so you maintain whatever your share is. And so I think that will speed up the pace of innovation. Uh, and it also creates really interesting ways for people to get compensated. Second one, which relates to the application, we are, we are moving into what a lot of people are calling a thick protocol layer or model where the value used to be in the application. So the value in Facebook was they wrote an application that stood on the shoulders of the internet protocols that were free. And they captured all that value. Now, it, that's being turned on its head, and you're having to pay for the protocols that run the blockchains, that run the cryptocurrencies. You're paying for the protocols, the smart contracts that are in the Ethereum network. And so this becomes really interesting in terms of if you build an application, you're probably having to compensate all of the people that are a part of the protocols now that you're moving in. So it's putting a lot more power into the people that are willing to think about protocols and write protocols, but it's interesting because it has to be done in concert with the people that are developing the applications. Um, so it makes that ecosystem, I think, super exciting, but also a little bit more complex because you need now, we have to talk to each other. We have to bring multiple people to the table in terms of the development efforts. And so that sort of team development, group development, especially remote development, um, will be interesting to see how it evolves. Um, and then the third shift, I think, is really this individual security management uh, in terms of managing public and private keys. Uh, today, we basically don't, we, you know, nobody keeps their money under their mattress, at least, you know, I don't think so. Uh, and so, you know, we have delegated a lot of that authority in terms of what we manage uh, from sort of our money and our privacy. That's all shifting. Um, or people, you know, has the potential to shift, right? So the, the saying is with, if you do have private keys, you know, uh, your keys, your money, not your keys, not your money. So if you use Coinbase, anybody have accounts at Coinbase, right? So not your keys, Coinbase owns all the keys. So if they got hacked, you wouldn't have any access to the money. And so not a bad thing, I think it's a great way to get people into it. But be aware of it, and if you have large amounts of cryptocurrency, they, every, you're encouraged to move it into either a hardware wallet or another device where you own the keys. Um, but the reality is, in order for us to get mass adoption, we're going to have to have a spectrum of key management, but we have to figure out how to get better at that. Um, and the last thing, I won't go through it, and you guys can look at it, but this is um, sort of uh, common, uh, what's known as the business model canvas. The interesting thing I want to highlight here is every element of a business is being disrupted from, by blockchain. You know, from the users, you, you got, how do, I, how do I interact with the unbanked? How do I interact with anonymous or pseudo pseudonymous people um, on the uh, sort of blockchains, right? We don't really do that. We sort of know everybody today for the most part. You know, revenue opportunities, there's more cost because I got to think about the miners and the people that are the, what are referred to as the oracles on the networks. They authenticate transactions or data uh, as part of transactions. So there's just a ton of disruption that's happening all across the business model that we have to think about how do we sort of deal with. Um, so fascinating set of problems as, um, but it really creates a lot of opportunities to go in and think about, you know, how do, how do wallets and smart contracts inter, uh, disrupt the channels that we're interacting? Brave browser is that browser I was mentioning, right? How we interact or potentially charge for our data. We've got all sorts of new, op, um, new proposition opportunities. I can now, it doesn't matter where workers are, I have a way of credibly negotiating with them and paying them. 
right? So the workforce becomes global. It means we all have to advocate for our value more strongly, know how we add value, know how we want to work with others. It puts a greater burden on all, all of us as individuals to interact within that ecosystem. Uh, so really excited about the potential. Um, and so I guess my challenge to you is we are early on and then you can make as much of an impact as you want in this space, right? The best time to have gotten started, no doubt, was 2008 in December or November when the white paper came out and I would advocate that the second best time is now. I mean, we are just now having a lot more infrastructure. People are trying to ask the questions, encouraging the research uh, and encouraging you know, you as a group, um, because you're going to be the people that use all these products, um, be a part of creating them. Uh, and so there's all sorts of different problems that we're trying to think about and solve across the board from sort of a blockchain alliance perspective. We want to think about applications and business models. We want to think about scalability and interoperability of how do we integrate these systems with existing systems. We want to think about policy. There's a great faculty member, um, um, uh, Eric Alton, over in the business school, who's really thinking about the law and the governance and how that comes to play. Uh, we've got Eric Wooster, who's teaching sort of solidity and teaching some programming within the CS department. Uh, and, and there's just really cool stuff going all over the state. Uh, and then there's going to be all these societal impacts. You know, what will be the impact? How will we have to change our behaviors? What are going to be some of the soft hurdles that might end up being the larger hurdles in ultimately driving adoption? So if you have any interest, would be happy to chat with you. Please reach out. Um, thank you for your time and would be happy to uh, answer any questions. So please, let's thank our speaker. So questions, comments, questions. So you have discussed all the advantages of What are the disadvantages? Why do people think not to use this technology? What were the disadvantages? The, the, one of the key disadvantages is the cost. Right? It is, and, and blockchain is not, be very skeptical. I encourage you to be skeptical when you hear people building blockchain applications. It is more expensive to run because it's distributed, because of the proof of work, because of all of the different actors that are needed to be in that ecosystem. Uh, so we need to sort of figure, figure out how to do that. Now, the interesting thing, if you go back and you look at the history of technology, it's called skeuomorphic design, that when we find a new technology, we apply it to existing problems. And so when steel was first built, the, the people use steel to build, rebuild, and build new one-story homes. It wasn't until 20 years, 30 years later that they realized that they could use steel to build skyscrapers. And so I think we're in that early phase where our tendency as humans is to take the new technology and apply it to existing problems. We didn't know how to do Facebook. Um, we didn't know how to do sort of the digital advertising on top of Facebook until Facebook existed. And so I think, we, I think we have to try stuff, but that also means people are trying stuff where it doesn't make sense or it won't make sense uh, down the road. Uh, yeah. There was other virtual currency as well, like Ruby, Ethereum as well. So why only Bitcoin got so much hype? Like not others, like and you don't know. And, uh, others. So, the, this ends up being an interesting question really in terms of economics and scale. So all of the altcoins and other coins that came after Bitcoin are competing with a larger network and a known network of value. So as, as, as the Bitcoin price continues to go up, if I'm having to invest a similar amount of effort to mine sort of an altcoin versus a Bitcoin, I'm going to do Bitcoin because I have a higher reward. Um, and so... A lot of people believe that the currencies will be like languages, that there will end up being a huge tier of them that will make sense for um, different transactions. So it is widely believed that Bitcoin, because of the cost, if they don't change the proof of work approach, will end up having higher transaction fees. Right now the transaction fees are low because if you mine, you get rewarded, you get a reward, a coin, what's referred to as a coin base if you win, if you basically are the successful miner. Um, when that goes away, it halves every four years. 
um, until it, it basically gets to its asymptote and, and it basically goes to zero. Then everything's paid with transaction fees. And so at that point, the miners will start to say, hey, we're going to charge transaction fees of X, which will drive up the price. And that was when probably people will migrate to other currencies where if it's less than a dollar or five dollars, you want to have something that has a really low fee, but you might be able to pay for million dollar homes or you, it might be government contracts on Bitcoin. So they'll, I think they'll end up with different uses. Yeah. What about the like crazy percentage of lost Bitcoins that live in landfills and yep. computers that have you know, never been turned on and live in somebody's basement and all. Isn't there something like half of all Bitcoins? I don't know if it's half, but it is, it is, a, it is a large number of Bitcoin. Um, so one of the things I would encourage you to start to think about and pay attention um, to is really sort of what governments do with currencies, right? So today the Fed lowered the interest rate in the U.S. And so what that does is it's basically like the U.S. putting more money into the economy, right? So that sort of raises inflation. Now, the nice thing about Bitcoin, and every time somebody loses a Bitcoin, it lowers, right? Bitcoin has about 21 million sort of Bitcoins that will ever be issued, and that's done algorithmically. It, it won't go higher. And in fact, if any disappear, get lost, that number gets lower. So that means there basically won't be inflation. Uh, because there won't be the ability to add new money into the ecosystem. And so a lot of people are taking a lot of comfort in there is no other currency, uh, you know, on the planet that has that protection. Every other currency, every fiat currency has the ability for a government to choose to print more. Um, because one, we're not tied to the gold standard anymore. And really what ended up happening is how that we got into the whole cycle, and it actually goes back to the Romans, is that when, go, when sort of governments go to war, they print more money because it's easier to print money to then win wars than it is to ask people to pay taxes for things that they might not agree with. And so all of a sudden they go to war, war ends, and you make a sal and your salary is worth 30% less than what it was because of the additional money that got pumped into the economy. So this is why I think th this whole space is so fascinating because we get exposed to these topics that we probably didn't think much about. Uh, but when you think about people from Venezuela and from Greece and from 30 other countries where the governments destroy the value of the currency overnight and in fact steal their money or confiscate money as they sort of cross boundaries and borders, um, that's what the vision of Bitcoin helps protect us against. Yeah? What's your opinion on uh, uh, higher levels from Bitcoin, for example, using like Lightning Network as a layer two solution or using side uh, chains like Liquid as a... Yeah, so I, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of those are fascinating, and I think we have to have them, right? So one of the things I didn't mention that uh, blockchain, or the Bitcoin blockchain, is, is limited by one megabit size blocks. And that's done, it roughly equates to about 2,000 transactions in a block, uh, and we, we know that those take about every 10 minutes. So it takes a while for transactions to be what's referred to as confirmed, uh, and that basically means they've gone through and they're not going to be sort of back, you know, uh, rolled back. Um, and so in order to get more transactions, so right now we're sort of, I think, 4,000-ish, two to 4,000 transactions per second um, type. Um, oh, I'm sorry, no, because we do 2,000 per block. So we're, you know, 1,000, a couple hundred if we look at it at a more granular level compared to Visa, which does 23,000. And they're doing that because they have a simpler database. You know, their whole infrastructure is distant. So the side chains, I think we've got to figure that out. The other thing is whether we have different currencies for the smaller payments where you immediately, you have different, you have, you, you settle off chain and then once you settle, you put it on chain. I think those are super cool. And I would, would love to see us stand up a lab where we start to test some of that stuff here. Cool, question? Mm -hmm. What is uh, the encryption that scares the transactions? Is it submitted over SSL, TLS? Like, what is going on in between that transition? So, the, so from my wallet to your wallet, I want to make a transaction. So that you, you basically, in your wallet, 
you sign it with your private key, and then it gets sent as a it sort of hash at that point, sort of encrypted, goes onto the chain. And then they can validate that, you know, that is, they can see that it's been signed, and then the unspent transactions or addresses that exist within that, that can be looked up to, make, to, to ensure they're valid. So some of the information at that point is not encrypted, right? It gets signed, but not all the data then in, it gets encrypted once it leaves your wallet uh, and goes up to the chain, because everybody has to be able to see the unspent transaction addresses that are part of the transaction. Hey, did, did, did that answer it? Well, I was just curious because I was looking at like AES is a tough uh, thing to crack, but the handshake in between is not that difficult. Is it vulnerable to similar things? Uh, I'm not that familiar. Do you, uh, do you, so if they catch it in the middle, uh, the problem is, is that it's signed towards a specific address already. You're not sending your private key. You're just signing the message with your private key. So if they catch it, they're getting that data, but they can't really edit it from it because they don't have your private key. Because they, they, can, they can see it was signed by you, but they can't work it back to the private key. Yeah. Um, so I get what you're saying. It's, it's great. Nobody can manipulate it. We can't drive the price with cutting interest rates and all that kind of stuff. But without any centralized system like the SEC, you also have people going into chat rooms saying, we're all going to talk about how great this is. We're going to drive the price up. We're going to get a whole bunch of schmucks to come in, buy it from us at this peak, and then we're all going to bail, and we're going to make all our money. And that's great, but it's also illegal in no, no, absolutely. current markets. So if there's no centralized system to protect against that, aren't you totally screwing over all of the lay users who just aren't that? So. I think education is key. Um, the fundamental assumption or hypothesis that is being made now is that when the six and a half billion people come in that want to be part of the banking system that have been ignored and want to be good actors, uh, that will sway that balance and that will protect the network. Um, in terms of you just end up having more good, right? Every, every new technology has been the criminals have um, a motivation to use new technology to stay ahead of the police um, to do any activity. Um, and so this is no different. And so everybody's, everybody's sort of belief and hope and, and sort of hypothesis is that as we get more people using it, the price will stabilize. There won't be the fluctuations as there are now, so you won't be able to drive it up. That still exists with stocks today, right? So it's no... It does. Yeah, in theory, the SEC can figure it out and prosecute people. That, in theory. That, no, that's correct. <laughs> and so, but this is, this is an interesting philosophical debate in terms of, hey, do I want to be completely in control? Um, and, and what do I want to have sort of centralized oversight, right? So an interesting thing, right? So the, the FDIC in terms of the banking or the sort of the backing up of the money in the bank really not that valuable, right? I mean, if, if something were to go really wrong, if you look at any of the other countries, well, the governments don't have money to back that up. So, right, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a hollow promise in terms of the government oversight on some of this. And so this is, you know, this is the thing that I think we're going to really grapple with as societies about what, how much responsibility are we really willing to take on? And, and and can we get ourselves to the level where we trust the technology? Uh, and I think we're actually a long way from that. This is, it's super fun to talk about. It's super exciting around the potential, but we're so far away from having my parents feel comfortable doing, you know, something with it or for <coughs> it to be really easy to use. And I, um, I'd love to, I was talking about a project, I'd love to find a way to set something up where you know, in a disaster relief area, the only money that got sent was through a cryptocurrency to see how easy we could make it to set up digital wallets on like Haiti or somewhere like that where they're in a crisis situation, the networks are down, they don't really have any training, but they can get, they can get critical money to buy supplies if they can figure out a wallet. I think if we can figure out use cases like that, we can make huge difference humanitarily, but we actually also solve the interface problems in terms of both trust and usability on a lot of the applications. Yeah. But companies like Walmart, IBM, <coughs> et cetera, they're all saying, let's take a look. 
let's go over there and see what's going on. And so they're making, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars in bets to find out what might be possible. And no, no, so that's exactly right. And they, and they have very specific use cases. So the, the fact that you have this, this audible time series database of transactions makes, if you're in a food business and you need to go find something that might have a coli in it and figure out where it came from to stop it, um, there's so many examples where some of the audits for um, either costs or where something went bad in a supply chain is now down to under an hour where it used to take them weeks. So that saves real money for the large um, retail sort of uh, companies in terms of how they manage their supply chain. So that's where that interest, even though it's not public, it's completely private, um, it gives them an ability to have more transparency at least with their suppliers, hold their suppliers accountable, everybody can see volumes, it helps with just-in-time delivery as well as then cost management. So I'm hearing supply chain definitely, but maybe for me, maybe 20 years from now. Well, supply, I mean, Walmart's implementing. I mean, supply chains, I would say, next five years in terms of being a wire thing. Um, I think a lot of the other consumer stuff will take longer. There's a lot of work going into games and fan engagement where we could wager tokens. We're doing some work with the, the Denver Broncos to create a token that allows people to bet, make bets in the stadium and then um, you accumulate tokens like air miles and then be able to redeem it for experiences. So there's really cool things where I think we'll get better at how the technology gets applied um, that will then start to form. But we've got to go where consumers want to go and that right now is either the cryptocurrencies, games, or you know, sort of entertainment, things of that nature. So other questions, comments, assertions, philosophical entreaties? <laughs> I think uh, <clears throat> Bitcoin can be used in illegal stuff like uh, let's say if I'm buying a Bitcoin in USA and uh, selling in another country, so I might be skipping the cross-country charges and all these things. So it should be legal or not? Well, I mean, this is the regulatory environment is really gray, right? So I think the if you're tr if you if you really wanted the the way people are being com as as anonymous as possible is is they're either getting paid in Bitcoin for doing services or they use Bitcoin ATMs, which are interesting. You load up cash and then that gets sent to an address. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be at your address. I mean, a lot of people are using Bitcoin ATMs to send money to somebody else's address um, and, and then you, no one knows that that money left. And so, I, you know, we, we have to work. We've got a pro, we got, had a meeting with the SEC about potentially doing some research with them about helping try to figure this out. They're trying to be as proactive as they can. It's not the easiest organization to be proactive, but um, there is a, if you're interested, there is a fantastic hackathon that starts this coming weekend up in Wyoming. Uh, they are the most progressive state in the United States. Uh, they have set cryptocurrency laws that are very progressive. They're attracting a ton of business to the state. They've got some phenomenal speakers. Um, it's supposed to be a super fun event. Um, but that's an example where they're trying to get ahead of the policy and regulation. <laughs> so um, I want to say this was a great talk. Let's thank our speaker. And if you have additional questions, he can stay around, but we are after five. And so thank you all for attending. And everybody think technology now. Cybersecurity policy. I can't hear you. <laughs> Cybersecurity <laughs> policy. Okay, that's enough. You're tired. Go on. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.